Saturday, November 28th, 2020, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So today, I want to dig deep into the World Economic Forum. I've been uh, talking about the World Economic Forum uh, since the beginning of June this year. Uh, and uh, I started noticing them a couple of years ago, maybe more, on Facebook. If you go on Facebook, if you are on Facebook, uh, and uh, I know a lot of people criticize Facebook, and I do as well, but be as it may, I'm still there. But if you uh, search World Economic Forum, you will see that uh, they have almost 8 million likes and uh, eight and a half million people that follow them. <laughs> and uh, if you scroll down uh, through their latest posting, you will see what kind of uh, institution they are. I would say uh, they are uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> and uh, the uh, Fabian Society, of course, uh, of which Tony Blair and the likes are members of, their original uh, coat of arms was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, what's their objective, <laughs> the Fabians? And I would say they're the same people that are related to uh, the people at the World Economic Forum. Uh, they, they want uh, to slowly uh, mold a society into a one world government. And uh, I think they also have the, the turtle as their sign because they're slow. Uh, they're not uh, very, uh, how can I say, conspicuous, but they infiltrate society, right? And that's what we're going to look at today. And uh, you might think, why are you talking about this? Well, because with what's going on, especially here in the UK and other countries, with all these uh, silly lockdowns for a virus that I admit is dangerous, but not any more dangerous than the normal flu, uh, they're talking about how uh, we're going to be under lockdown to probably April next year. That So that will, will have been a year. There is no excuse for this, really. And, and I think the World Economic Forum, the EU, um, <laughs> the Old Reich, of course, there's an old saying by the Nazis, uh, of course, when they lost the war, their saying is that uh, for uns, Der Krieg in ist niemals vorbei. So that means uh, for us, the war will never be over. So, uh, yes, and we heard about Operation Paperclip. I've read books about that. I think it was called uh, uh, Space by James Meissner about all the uh, Nazi uh, scientists, including uh, Werner von Braun who were sent to the U.S. They basically created uh, NASA, right? And they infiltrated, I would say, the deep state. But uh, to start today, uh, I want to look at uh, this book here, The New Underworld Order, Triumph of Criminalism, Dark Actors Playing Games, The Global Fantasies of the Geomasonic Illuminati by Christopher Story, author of the European Union Collective. Uh, Christopher Story, uh, we'll go over him because you might say, oh, this guy is crazy. What's he uh, going on about? But um, let's go over Christopher Story here. He died in 2010, unfortunately. And I actually started looking into him probably back in 2004 and five. And he was based out of London. I used to read uh, his reports on the internet. And I even went... Uh, to meet him once in his office, Christopher Story. So this is uh, Christopher Story's background. Christopher Edward Harl Story was an English writer, publisher, and government advisor specializing in intelligence and economic affairs, who is perhaps best known for his collaboration with KGB defector Anatoly Galitsyn on the 1995 book, The Paris Troika Deception. Uh, it says, since 1970, Story edited and published International Currency Review, which has included the World Bank, the Federal Reserve, and the Bank of England amongst its subscribers. Story became an economic advisor to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and in 1991, a year after her resignation, he published 
Soviet analyst due to his continued skepticism about Mikhail Gorbachev, Perestroika, and the official version uh, of events in the Soviet Union. Soviet analyst was a respected journal whose previous editors include, included Robert Conquest and Tibor Samueli. So he was an advisor uh, to Margaret Thatcher, and uh, you can understand probably why Margaret Thatcher was against uh, joining the European Union or joining the European uh, uh, Monetary Union as well. Uh, and I think it's because of what uh, she learned from Christopher Story. My uh, Monaco 64 mug. If you want to help the channel, you can get one of these there. You can get end of fed mugs and other mugs and other things uh, in the Teespring store. So let's continue into uh, Mr. Story's background. So it says here, in May 1992, Story was approached by KGB defector Anatoly Galitsyn, who supported Story's analysis of the Soviet Union and Soviet analyst. Galitsyn handed over to Story his memoranda to the CIA, which Story edited and published in 1995, as the perestroika deception. So this is where it gets really interesting and it's very important for what's happening today. The purpose of perestroika has been to convince the gullible West that communism is dead, that the Soviet Union has collapsed. Story said that he agreed with Galitsyn that the Sino-Soviet split was a deception which masked the continued collaboration between Russia and China. Uh, and this is to do with uh, the European Union as well. In 2002, Story published the European Union Collective, applied Story's analysis to the European Union. He was also critical of the German intelligence establishment, pointing out its Nazi origins. Story claimed that former British Prime Minister Edward Heath was recruited by Germans before the war and was an agent of the secret Nazi strategic continuum since exposed as the Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst DVD. Story claimed that successive European collective treaties have been routinely procured by means of bribery and that there was a corrupt financial incentive for ratification of the Treaty of Lisbon which enter into force in 2009. So let's go into page 591 of this book here by Christopher Story to see uh, the relationship between the Third Reich and the eventual European Union. So as you can see, it says, Europäisch Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft. So let's see what uh, Christopher Story says here. It says, figure 92, the front cover of Europäisch Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft. Uh, which translates to European Economic Community. Sounds familiar? A compendium of lectures by senior Nazis given at a symposium in 1941 and published in book format in 1942 by Haude and Spanish Verlagungshandlung, Max Planck, Berlin. One copy of this volume is to be found in the British Library, but the copy reviewed here was found in the Staatsbibliothek Berlin with the stamp of the Preussische Staatsbibliothek. The, the chapter headings of this work correspond almost precisely to the primary themes of the Maastricht Treaty and its subsequent updates. So you can see why uh, Margaret Thatcher was very much opposed to the Maastricht Treaty. She was advised by Christopher Story, and Christopher Story knew who was behind the Maastricht Treaty. Corrupt payola payments were distributed to facilitators of the European Union's Maastricht Treaty, just as was the case with the aborted EU Constitution Treaty. In that case, a corruption amount of $5 billion was allocated from a Swiss slush fund to be paid out in two segments of 2.5 billion divided into 50 payments equivalent of 100 million each. So there you go. So you might ask, uh, what's this got to do with the uh, World Economic Forum? Well, uh, let's have a look here. This is a, a document 
from the World Economic Forum. Uh, the World Economic Forum started out in 1971 as the European Management Forum, and uh, their second uh, forum for, uh, or meeting, uh, the second European Management Symposium, as the, they called it, took place in 1972. You can see here uh, the people that were uh, sponsoring and were chairing the European Management Forum. Uh, one of them was Mr. Altiero Spinelli, an Italian uh, who was originally a communist, from what I've read, and he was a member of the Commission of European Communities, so European Economic Communities, and uh, the man who was supposed to be the chairman of this forum, apparently uh, it says here that he couldn't uh, show up. I wonder why, <laughs> and you will see uh, why I think he didn't show up. Uh, the chairman chairing uh, this second symposium was a man by the name of Dr. Herman uh, Joseph Abs. At the time, he was chairman of Deutsche Bank, right? That good old uh, Deutsche Bank that uh, seems to uh, never die. So this is what they say about this second uh, forum. At the second Davos, the forum focused on Europe, reflecting widespread enthusiasm for enlargement of the European Communities EC from six to nine countries with the addition of Denmark, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. Coincidentally, the new members of the EC signed the Treaty of Ascension on 22nd January 1972, the first day of the Second Symposium. Notably, a forum document de defined the Foundation's goals as follows. The European Management Forum was established to provide international and particularly uh, European business with a select forum for study, discussion, and determination of concepts and objectives for responsible and su successful management. So this is uh, what he. So this is what the document says about Herman Abs, the meeting chairman, Herman Joseph Abs, chairman of Deutsche Bank, and the most prominent European business leader at the time, had to cancel his participation at short notice, as a last resort, Klaus Schwab filled the vacancy. This was the first and only Davos for which Schwab himself would serve as the meeting uh, chairman. So they had some other people there, I think like the Habsburgs, uh, Otto von Habsburg, he was in the first meeting. He wanted to reunify Europe as well, right? So there's the connection between uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, the EU, and uh, so do you think the World Economic Forum was happy with the Brexit vote? <laughs> I don't think so. And uh, someone recently also uh, posted this on Twitter. It's a photo of Matt Hancock with Klaus Schwab at Davos. And this was in 2018, where they discussed the fourth industrial revolution. You kind of wonder about Brexit and whether they're really uh, taking us out of this uh, European Union. Maybe in name they are, but in practice, <laughs> the fact that we are falling uh, the World Economic Forum and uh, their script for this Great Reset makes me wonder if it's just like a a head fake. You know, look here, we're getting out of the EU, but we're getting into this Great Reset, into this one world government, right? So what about Herman Joseph Abs? <laughs> this gets really interesting because I've read many books because some people might uh, be watching this and saying, what do you know about this? Uh, you are a conspiracy theorist. Well, usually the, the people who say that, they haven't done any research. They haven't read uh, as many books as I have, uh, or maybe they have, but not the kinds of books that I have. Uh, but this book here, I read back in the 90s, really, over 25 years ago, probably. And at the time, I didn't put everything together like I'm putting now, like uh, the Third Reich, uh, the uh, World Economic Forum, the European Union, and so on. If you really wanna know uh, what the Germans did, not just to the Jews, but to the whole of Europe, uh, you should read this book. Uh, it's called Pack of Thieves. It's by Richard Chesnoff, and it says, How Hitler and Europe Plundered the Jews 
and committed the greatest theft in history. So this is a really good book. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this book, or I'm not going to talk about it at all. But I would say that Herman Abbs uh, shows up in this book a little bit. But the one that he really shows up in is The Tower of Basel. And here we go again. Uh, what's The Tower of Basel? Well, it's a book about the uh, Bank for International Settlements. And what's the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, or the BIS? Well, it's a supranational, above-the-law bank that was created by treaty, uh, international treaty in 1930, that is answerable to no one, and it's the bank for the central bankers. It's where uh, representatives of the major central banks, usually uh, the top guys from the central banks like Powell or the top girl now from the ECB, Lagarde, or uh, Matthew Bailey from the Bank of England, the Japanese counterpart, they meet every other month uh, for dinner and for a private chat about the world and what they're planning to do. So highly recommend this book. It says The Shadowy History of the Secret Bank That Runs the World by Adam Libor. I've spoken about this book many times, but today we're going to reference it so we can uh, see who Herman Joseph Abbs was, because this guy was involved right in the beginning with uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, at the time called the European Management Forum. He was even chosen to be the chairman of their se second uh, forum. So we'll jump to page 153. It says here, like Schacht during the 1930s, Ludwig Erhard, the economic director of the Western Occupation Zones, well, that was after... Uh, the fall of the Reich or the end of the war, uh, the Western occupation zones, uh, that's uh, the zones occupied by the US, uh, Britain and France, right? That's how they, which actually became uh, West Germany afterwards. The uh, Eastern zone is of course the Soviets, was hailed as a miracle maker. That was Ludwig Erhard, right? The truth was more prosaic Erhard, a future chancellor of West Germany, was an ambiguous figure. He had refused to join any Nazi party organizations and was connected to the German resistance. But Erhard had accepted funds from the Reichsgruppe Industry, the organization of German industrialists, including IG Farben, that supported Hitler. He was awarded the War Service Cross for his work on economics. By 1943, Erhard's work had come to the attention of the German bankers and industrialists who realized that the war was lost. They formed two groups to prepare for the future and ensure their continuing economic power in the post-World War. So that's the old saying, uh, for uns uh, der Krieg in ni ist niemals vorbei, right? They were preparing for this. The Committee for Foreign Economic Affairs, composed of financiers and industrialists, and the small working group composed solely of industrialists, including Hermann Schmidt, uh, the CEO of IG Farben and BIS director. Erhard was the connection between the two groups. So here's where Abs, Herr Abs, or Dr. Abs, comes in, into the picture. The members of the committee for foreign economic affairs included Hermann Abs of Deutsche Bank, the most powerful commercial banker in the Third Reich. That's Hermann Joseph Abs, right? The guy who was, uh, who canceled uh, uh, his visit to the uh, European Management uh, uh, Forum in the last minute in 1972. Do you think uh, some people high up that were attending that forum probably uh, had a, a word with Mr. Schwab saying, do, do we really want this guy here? Who knows? <laughs> so it says, the dapper, elegant Abs was an old friend of the BIS. He had been sent there by Schacht. Well, Schacht was Hitler's banker, right? During the 1930s to try and stall demands for repayments of the loans that financed Germany after 1918. In Basel, Abs frequently met with a British banker called Charles Gunston, who was 
a protege of Montague Norman. Montague Norman, uh, he was uh, the governor of the Bank of England for like over 20 years. I think uh, he left in 1944. Gunston managed the Bank of England's German desk, which made him immensely important in the 1930s. And here's an interesting part about Gunston. It says Gunston was so keen on the new Germany that he spent his 1934 summer holidays at a work camp for enthusiastic Nazi party members. I think some of you uh, probably remember there was a story that came out probably in the mail, I think, some years ago, showing photos of a young, uh, well, before she was queen, of course, as a child, Queen Elizabeth or Princess Elizabeth, I don't know how they call her, uh, doing a, a Nazi salute, right? So people were very uh, enthusiastic about what was happening in Germany, especially uh, the aristocracy in the UK. He also admired abs and later described him as a very urbane, always a velvet glove around an iron fist. Abs did not join the Nazi party, but he was so essential for the functioning of the Third Reich's economy that he did not need to. As the head of Deutsche Bank's foreign department during the war, Abs was the linchpin of the continent-wide plunder, directing the absorption of Aryanized banks and the companies across the Third Reich. So, you see, that's where that book comes in. During the 12 years of the Third Reich, so that was 1933 to 1945, the bank's wealth quadrupled. <laughs> That's Deutsche Bank. Apps sat on the board of dozens of companies, including naturally IG Farben. So that's Herr Abs' backgrounds. The guy who was invited by Klaus Schwab was also born in Germany, I think 1937. Uh, he talks about how his dad ran a Swiss machinery, industrial machinery company, but he never talks about what his father was doing uh, during the war. Was he working? Uh, did he know uh, Herr Abs during the war? Maybe. <laughs> if uh, Herman Abs was the most influential commercial banker in Germany, there, there was a chance there is a chance that they knew each other, right? And I think uh, at the time, uh, in 1972, Herman Abs would be uh, would have been a, a lot older than uh, Klaus Schwab, right? It would have been like a father figure, I would say. Let's have a look at how Abs now got away <laughs> after the war. How he he wasn't uh, sent to Nuremberg, right? The Nuremberg trials. This is page 187. Hermann Abs of Deutsche Bank was the most powerful commercial banker in the Third Reich, and he was not on Dulles's A-list. Rather, he was high on an allied blacklist of important Nazi officials to be arrested. In the American zone, Colonel Bernard Bernstein, the head of the finance division, had Abs, indeed, all the Nazi fi financiers in his sights. Bernstein ordered that every banker and industrialist be detained as a suspected war criminal. Luckily for Abs, he was living in the British zone. There he met his old friend, Charles Gunston of the Bank of England, how convenient, and the BIS, who, whom he used to see in Basel during the 1930s at BIS meetings. Gunston was a senior official in the British Occupation Authority, Gunston had no interest in the Nazi atrocities. Well, he was a fan of the Nazis, wasn't he, as we saw? All he cared about was getting the banks working again. Gunston asked Abs to help rebuild the banking system in the British zone. Abs was more than happy to oblige. I'm sure he was. <laughs> I think he'd rather do that than go to Nuremberg. Bernstein was enraged and demanded that Abs be ex extradited to the American zone. Gunston refused, but in early January 1946, he returned to England. Abs was then finally arrested as a suspected war criminal, and he spent three months in prison before being released and was never charged. Instead, Abs went to work fulfilling his promise 
to his old friend Charles Gunston. So we now move to page 192, and it's still about Abs and what happened to him uh, after uh, World War II. When in 1964 the central bankers of the European Economic Community set up their Governor's Committee to coordinate monetary policy, the committee was located not in Brussels, the home of the European project, or Frankfurt, the site of the, site of the Bundesbank, but at the BIS headquarters, the BIS helpfully provided the governor's committee with the necessary secretarial and administrative support. The following year, in 1965, the BIS even reached agreement on its 1930s investments in Germany, the Young Plan loans. The Reichsbank had serviced the loans and paid interest until the end of the war in April 1945. After a 20-year break, Germany agreed to resume paying interest on the loans, but deferred the capital repayment until 1996. Uh, the deal was brokered by Herman Abs. So here we, we go. The most uh, influential commercial banker during the Reich uh, negotiating the deal. Who had returned to Deutsche Bank? Like Karl Blessing, Abs had expertly whitewashed his Nazi past there is no mention of Abs' role at the bank that organized the plunder of Nazi-occupied countries or his former position on the board of IG Farben. Abs had been the most powerful commercial banker in the Third Reich and now enjoyed familiar status and acclaim in the new Germany. He was also a welcome guest in the world's treasuries and chancelleries. Abs sat on the board of so many companies including Daimler-Benz, the Federal Railways, Lufthansa, that a law known as Lex Abs was passed, limiting the number of positions an individual could hold uh, to 10. So that's the background of Herman Abs, a man that uh, Klaus Schwab thought was uh, so important that he uh, named him as the chairman of the second European Management Forum, uh, the precursor, of course, to the World Economic Forum. So um, I'm not going to go uh, into the Great Reset or the Fourth Industrial Revolution. I've actually created a playlist on my YouTube channel about uh, the World Economic Forum, about Davos. It's called Davos Man. I'm going to put this video into that playlist as well. And if you haven't watched all the other videos, if you're new to the channel, I recommend you watch them. And I'm also going to put uh, the link uh, to an article I wrote in my blog, Maneco64.net, below in the description, uh, where I speak about uh, the origins of the World Economic Forum. I wrote that back in June. So I have been uh, on top of this uh, for, for months. And uh, I don't think there's anything good coming out of the World Economic Forum. They are a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, and, and I think they want to uh, basically put us into a, a world government where uh, countries and nations are subservient to, to technocrats like uh, Mr. Schwab, who are not really uh, elected, haven't been elected and chosen. I noticed yesterday that uh, Klaus Schwab uh, opened a Twitter account, and uh, someone noted that you can't comment on it. So that's how transparent uh, this guy is. He opens a Twitter account and doesn't allow the public to comment on it. I wonder why. So there you go. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button. And as I said earlier, this video is probably uh, gonna be shadow banned because the same people uh, behind the World Economic Forum, behind the EU, behind this one world government, behind the central banks. They control now uh, companies uh, or they work together with companies like Google who own uh, YouTube. Uh, they, can, they work together with Twitter, Facebook, and all the big tech companies. So make sure you share it and uh, let people know about this video so we can get the word out. So you can also uh, follow me uh, on Twitter, Parler, uh, Facebook, and all these other platforms below here. So there you go. I, I wish you all a great uh, weekend, <laughs> if it really matters, because it seems like every day now is like the same under lockdown. 
uh, you can go out, but uh, uh, what you can do here in the UK is very limited. I, I guess from next week after December 2nd, we'll be able to do a few more things. But all these tiers are, are really, um, I think, uh, just a euphemism for, for lockdown. So take care.